Eh, simplemente me gustaría, eh, para iniciar, eh, presentar a los panelistas. Eh, en primera instancia tendríamos eh, a Ellen Helsper, de London School of Economics. Eh, Ellen es profesora asociada del Departamento de Comunicación y Medios en la London School eh, of Economics and Political Science. Sus intereses de investigación incluyen los vínculos entre las desigualdades sociales y digitales, eh, nuevos públicos en los medios de comunicación, comunicación interpersonal, mediada, innovación metodológica, en medios cuantitativos y cualitativos y sobre la investigación en medios de comunicación. Eh, vamos a hacer de la siguiente forma, voy presentando cada uno, toman la palabra y luego los demás. Entonces, por favor, Helen. Ah, sí. ah, bueno, Um, okay, I'll do it in English. I keep switching between languages, but I'll do it in English. makes it probably easier because the slides are in English. Um, so I'm going to go, like the morning session was quite specific, detailed. GDP, a very specific aspect of the economy and digital economy in particular, which is what we are kind of talking about today. Um, I'm going to go completely the other side. I'm going to take a broad perspective conceptualizing some of the issues that we see. And I was asked to talk about internet use. Um, and as I hope will become clear during my presentation, um, this is broader than just use of the internet as it's often quite narrowly defined. And I'll really also talk about why it matters. And I'm putting this uh, in relation to a few questions that we've been asking ourselves, or at least the people that I'm working with is this question about are we really ready for a digital future? We as societies, peoples, individuals, citizens, or rather maybe the question is who is going to be ready for that digital future? Who's going to be able to use the internet in ways that um, improve our general well-being? So my presentation will actually be more about well-being, so also that broader aspect of these digital societies that we're living in. And the question that comes from that is then when we talk about measurement or when we talk about conceptualization, we need to think about what does it mean to use the internet? What does it mean to be digitally engaged with the world that we're living in and the world that we're going to be living in? So while there is a lot of the big data um, hype, let's call it a little bit of a hype, that's out there is about this, a lot of really fine-grained data, which if we could get our hands on it and analyze it, we get a really detailed picture of what people are doing. But the truth is that we don't really yet know on how, uh, about much about how we can use that data or what kind of data we need to be able to predict what people will be doing in the future and which people will be doing what in the future. It's a very descriptive account that we have. I will be um, talking about this project, or the project called From Digital Skills to Tangible Outcomes Project. It's a project that is, uh, runs across countries, uh, develops measurements of um, uses of the internet, but also of uh, digital skills and outcomes. And I'll be using that framework because, partly because it was developed by me um, and taken up by all these other countries, but also because I think it really um, exemplifies why it is important. So why does internet use matter? And I'm sure that all of us sitting here in the room kind of, you know, know and we, we, or we think that we know and we have it in the back of our minds, but it's good to reiterate that. Because it's worth reminding ourselves that it matters because it matters for individuals, for citizens, for consumers, but also, or therefore, for governments, for commercial organizations, for NGOs, the third sector, just as much as for the more um, commercial side of the societies that we live in. Whether we like it or not, for good or for bad, right? Um, the world is going to be increasingly digital. I don't think that's a trend that we're going to counter. Um, so therefore, we need to really understand that who is pushing these services, who is pushing these activities, because that's what happening at, is happening at the moment. Governments, um, the third sector, commercial companies, are pushing services and content online. 
and our friends and employers, the people we know are expecting us to be in that digital space, to interact with us. So everything is going digital by default, which is a term that's used quite a lot in Europe, and especially in the UK where I'm normally based. Um, and there's been a bit of resistance to that because we know that if you are not online, so if you're not digitally engaged, it is really difficult to get not only a taxi, <laughs> or a taxi that's safe, perhaps, but also it's difficult to get benefits. It's becoming more and more difficult to get a job. It's becoming more and more difficult to build up networks that will help you get to a place where you can get access to and use all those services. So it creates real barriers for full participation in society as citizens and consumers, etc. And worryingly, what we see is that those who are traditionally excluded, who have come from disadvantaged backgrounds, are also likely to be less engaged, less included, less able to use um, the opportunities or access the opportunities that are available in those digital spaces. And what we have seen in the research that I've been doing is that there is a real tendency for when we just talk about the digital and we just think about the digital when we introduce these technologies and services for those who are already marginalized to become even further marginalized. We've called it um, the emergence of a digital underclass in some of the studies that we're doing where they're being left even further behind. So I'll walk through the framework before talking about more about measurement, which is the topic of this seminar. I talk about this as social digital inequalities. And because the truth is that when I talk about this topic and in my research, I don't really care that much about the digital, to be honest. I care about what the digital does to our everyday lives, our well-being, what are the outcomes that we're getting from it. So my starting point when I talk about this is really that social world, the world we live in, that we've lived in for, for many, many years. And everything that I do is contextualized within that. So I start with these resources that we have. And we have a lot of theory, sociological, economic theory, about what are the resources that people have that access to, to some extent, some people more or some people less, um, that allow us to participate fully and to get the benefits uh, of the society that we live in. So, um, you know, economic resources, typical, but social, personal, civic resources, all these kinds of aspects of our lives. And these resources in themselves are barriers to engaging in the digital world. At the most basic level, it's about getting access, right? How much money you have, but also um, kind of um, where you, where you live, the people around you, do they have access to technologies? This is what we call the first level divide. And so when we talk about internet news in the most basic sense, all of a the things that we're worried about is this. And this was, this was for a very long time, almost the sole definition of a digital divide or what it meant to use or not to use. So we saw measurements around access as well. However, you know, a recent decade, recently, this has become a more complex type of discussion where we're talking about something that might be this called the second level digital divide, which is a much more nuanced picture of what it means to be engaged, which goes from what are the skills that we have to engage with the content that is online? Because what we've seen is that you get ac that even people who have access are often not able to use the technologies in ways that are actually beneficial to uh, the resources that they want to access uh, online. But it's also about motivation, awareness, knowledge about what that digital world is about, what it might do for you, rather than just kind of um, knowing that it's useful for other people, right? Has to be useful for you. And also what we include in that second level digital divide is different types of engagement. Because we talked about classification in the previous session, like the internet is everything. Right? It goes from buying a car to um, talking to you know, my um, mother who is in a different continent to um, finding out where the latest movie is, getting cheaper tickets for that. It's about healthcare, it's about all those things. So it's important that we have an understanding of how these things are distributed, how we classify actual engagement or use. And then, and this is really the kind of, what sums up that framework and where I started, is that what is really important is that those kind of things in the digital world, in the end, should translate into tangible outcomes or benefits in our everyday lives. And I'll, this is what's going to, the rest of my presentation really is going to be about, is that it's not clear that access 
or digital skills, or actually use of the internet translates into outcomes for everybody. And this creates a very big problem for measurements if we talk about statistics, because we might be thinking we're measuring something when we're measuring use, as in we're thinking that if somebody looks for a job that will lead to better outcomes in the employment market if they look for a job online, but there's actually a disconnect between those two issues. And that's what I will spend the next few minutes talking about. So when we talk about digital engagement, and this is a kind of, I think it was sold as a more conceptual session, so I'll approach it from a conceptual point of view. We need to really think about how do we conceptualize those different elements, and I'll talk about how this has been operationalized in different, um, different uh, large national statistical bodies and uh, international uh, statistical organizations that have been looking at this. So what is my definition? Internet use should be seen in, in relation to that context of what it can bring to individuals. And the definition that I have up here kind of reflects that multi-layered approach, the different elements that come <coughs> into play when we talk about internet use or digital engagement. So for me, an individual is socially and dig social digitally included when they have the opportunity and the ability to use, or, and this is important, not to use <laughs> ICTs or information and communication technologies in ways that help them achieve these tangible, high quality outcomes in everyday life. Now obviously, the opportunity here is, is very much reflected in that debate that we had around access. And most of the, that is actually the easiest area of this whole debate. And what a lot of policies have focused on, what a lot of measurement has focused on, is access infrastructure. Is there, are there pipes to somebody's home? What kind of speed do people have? And things like that. And as we see societies increasingly digitizing and infrastructures increasingly improving, we see that certain people are able to take advantage of that and other people aren't. So using is a different thing. That same infrastructure is used in very, very different ways by different people. Now, when I was asked to talk about internet use, and maybe when you saw the, the, the presentation, this is what we, what we think about when we think about internet use. It's, it's what do we do? You know, what, do we, what kind of class of activities do we undertake online? But, as I already said, we need to think about also what we can do or what we know about that digital world. Because sometimes we don't do things because we know they're not that useful for us. So if we just measure use, we don't measure whether somebody is able to really participate in society. So when we think about measurement of skill, we need to measure skill not by, or measure skill not by measuring what people are doing, but what they might be able to do. Like when we talk about reading literacy, we don't measure if somebody has read Jane Austen's novel. We teach them how to read whatever kind of text come in front, comes in front of them. And we don't just uh, teach them to read that text, but we it, teach them to be able to read that text and do something with it. Either learn a lesson about life, or read the instructions on the back of a can, and being able to open the can afterwards. And for those who are more familiar with that literacy debate, we know that there's actually quite a lot of people who know how to read, but then don't know how to open that can after they've learned how to read. So that kind of functional literacy. So this is why skills are really important and we need to think of them alongside use. We need to think of them especially in terms of the outcomes because it's a combination of all these things, skills, um, uses, and our access that we have that allows us to translate that into outcomes. And if skills are unequally distributed or we don't really know what the skills are, we don't know what the outcomes are that people are gonna get from that use. So what can we actually do for them? So in statistical bodies, there's been, you know, we can see kind of a development in how they've tried to measure use. And the, the, what I already said, access, basic, first divide that I talked about, where people really are access, uh, talking about accessing and using different devices and platforms. This is now a, almost a standard measurement in many of, you know, Eurostat, OECD, ITU, they measure these kinds of things. What kind of access do you have? Do you have access to the following devices? Now we see a big splurge in mobile phones. A lot of people are connecting on mobile phones. A lot of people are collect 
now connecting through mobile phones only, which has big implications actually in terms of how they can use technologies or what they can do with technologies. So this is also why we're thinking about um, not just do you have access to them, have you used a particular device, but how often we're using this. And this is again quite standard now in most of the statistics. So have you used the internet in the last six months? I've had whole conferences where we just talk about that question. Should it be six months? Should it be three months? Should it be ever? What is an internet user? Do people even know what it means to use the internet? Because if I'm checking my WhatsApp, is that using the internet? I, I'm a chat, you know, people often don't know what the internet is anymore. So this is another reason why it's important to check outcomes and types of engagement rather than asking them about just general internet use because what we do rather than whether we're using it. So that brings me to the, the third kind of in this use approach, which is asking people what they do or how often they've done things online. And so then we see that people say, I'm on you know, um, Twitter all the time, it was mentioned before, I'm on um, you know, eBay all the time buying things. Um, so this is where the kind of, this is where we're at right now in most types of measurements and statistics. And the assumption is that using the internet frequently for a wide variety of purposes means that those people who do that are getting the benefits out of using that technology. And we know that that's not the case, as I've already mentioned before. So this is when now where like, uh, a lot of uh, discussion and debates going on, it's like, okay, how can we actually then measure what these outcomes might be in terms of the added value for people's everyday lives? So it's kind of what I call here use 3.0, is to use the internet for specific purposes, but the ability to do it. And why this is important, because there's a lot of new platforms out there right now, and there's gonna be a, next, a platform next month, but we need to know whether people feel that if they will be encountered with, like if they encounter a new type of activity or a new type of platform, that they will be <coughs> able to take that up. So that they have the kind of broad uses of general activities in these areas that I talked about in terms of resources, that they have a kind of a general understanding of what this internet has to offer and that they feel like they're able to do that. So that's also a part of that is confidence. And this, is, this needs to be distinguished. These two things need to be distinguished. Confidence is not the same as ability. And where we see inequalities, for example, we often see the inequalities in the confidence rather than in the ability. And this is, brings me to what, for me, is the state of the art and the stuff that we've been working on a lot, which is thinking about transferable skills. For me, what we are, the moment we are at right now in terms of measuring internet use and kind of t able use of the internet is thinking about these transferable skills. We're at the moment where education was many, many years ago when we decided that math, and in England, English, and uh, chemistry, were the core courses that everybody had to take to be able to then afterwards participate. We don't actually have that good of an idea what that is like in the digital space. Like if we say we need to make somebody digitally skilled, what are these skills that we're talking about? And the consensus is now getting to this point where they're making a distinction, a general distinction between more harder skills like operational or technical skills, how to use a device and how to kind of navigate that um, hyper-connected space versus the softer skills, which are those social communicative, knowing how to use the technology to uh, build relationships with other people, um, to present yourself in a way that will uh, you know, be beneficial to you, um, but also things like content creation. And I'm not necessarily talking about coding here, which is uh, a, a favorite um, uh, topic of conversation in a lot of policymaking. I'm talking from the very basic principle of do you know how to create this CV, for example, and upload it? Do you know how to um, you know, look at images and, and distribute them to an audience so that they will know who you are and that you can actually not just passively use what's available online, but also produce stuff that will make you a part of that space? Because one of the big problems that we see right now is that especially those softer skills, so the social communicative and the content creation skills, are the most unequally distributed. I don't know if anybody you know, and I'm not gonna mention the number because I've completely forgotten it at the moment, but it is definitely 
80% and upwards in terms of who is pr uh, uh, producing content online. Wikipedia was mentioned before. It's in terms of where it's produced. It's about, it's, I think, almost up to 80% is produced in English language countries. Even the information about Mexico is probably not produced in Mexico. Yeah. The, it's men. It's men, uh, white men, yeah, Caucasian men of a very certain age. And if you really drill down to it, they are v based in a very particular part of the United States, which I think you can um, probably guess where that is, yeah. which is where I've just come from, Los Angeles, California, but California in general. Yeah. So this is, this is important. Why? Because, and I will show a little bit of data, because I didn't want to make this a statistical presentation after this slide, about, because it's those skills that allow us to translate using the internet for certain purposes into these tangible outcomes in our everyday lives. And this is the classification that we are using to classify different types of activity and engagement online. This is a work in progress, but it's, you can see that it's based on a more traditional classification. For those of you who know well, Bourdieu or other kind of uh, so, uh, sociologists or political economists who work in this field, these are the kinds of resources that we um, have access to. And we need to separate out here the input, yeah? where do people come from, where do they start when they're born, the types of engagement, the types of things that they do online, like um, looking for a job, and the outcomes, which is getting a job. And I would say, in the framework that we're using, it's not just about getting a job, but getting a job that's a good job <laughs> that you get paid enough for to be able to you know, live an okay, if not extremely wealthy, but at least comfortable life, yeah. and to get access to the health care that we need. So I promised that I'd present some data, and this is where it always becomes you know, kind of big models and, and detail. So again, why does all this matter? And I think I hope I, I hope I made that clear. It matters because we're worried about the outcomes. And when we talk about use, the use matters because it leads to certain outcomes. Now, what we <coughs> what I already mentioned is that these um, like obviously access and operational and information navigation skills are fundamental to be able to use the technologies. Without those, you're not going to be able to do much. If you don't have access, that's the end of it, right? So I'm not saying that those are not the things that you know, policymakers or statisticians should measure, but it's those so softer social and creative skills that really determine how people use the technology, even for areas where we might not be completely kind of aware that these are really important. So it's clear that social skills influence people's social uses of the technology. But for example, what we see is that these uh, content creation and, and social skills really influence those more productive or productivity areas related to economic outcomes. And that those are also the ones that are more universal skills. That if people have really high social and content creation skills, they are able to get a wide variety of benefits from it. While operational skills are actually really important for very, a very narrow kind of very task-oriented type of use of technologies, they don't really do much for things that are more complex. One of the other interesting things that we've seen is that use does not automatically lead to outcomes and that for some types of uses, sorry, some types of uses, like economic uses of the internet, which is the model that I show here, are very good predictors of economic outcomes. That's fine. But they don't predict much else. Well, if we see the social uses of technology, like somebody who really knows how to hone those uh, like social networking sites or email or communicative technologies, who, really, who is really broadly um, active and engaged with those kinds of activities, they have economic outcomes. They have a better personal kind of health outcomes. They have better social outcomes, very clearly. But they also have things like culture, like a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, a sense of knowing where you are in the world, a sense of community. And it's the same thing for like, things that have more to do with content creation. 
So the lessons that we've learned from both like looking at the data that we've gathered and the instruments that we've tried to develop and from policy interventions is that infrastructure policies are not enough. And they're really just really, really the basic start. Because if we just think about infrastructure as an equivalent for use, rolling out infrastructure, what we see is that only the people who already have quite a lot of resources are the ones who are able to take that up. That means that a huge part, and we're talking about economics here, right? A huge part of the population is not included in that. That's a loss of um, capital, a loss of um, kind of a wealth of experience and, and things like that that we're losing. Women, you know? I'm glad to see there's another woman on this panel, by the way. <laughs> um, so women are tend to also not be as presented in some of these spaces, right? So rolling out just infrastructure is not enough. Same with skill and awareness training, it's not enough. Not on its own. Because if you are really good at using technology, but the kind of world around you is only provides the type of content that is useful to people who are not like you. Yeah. I do a lot of work with young people who are not in education, employment, or training. And all of the skills training they get is how to upload CVs and how to you know, go to job sites. I can tell you that even if they are very good at that, they often do not find the kinds of jobs or the kinds of things that will actually be useful for them or beneficial for them. Or they don't know how to navigate the educational world. And what this means is that so content provision is also not enough because what we see is that this is embedded, and I I'm sadly won't be able to show you that here because um, I don't have access to a keyboard, but I will, um, say, uh, I will show you the link, is that what we're noticing now is because um, uh, one of the projects that we're doing in the From Digital Skills to Tangible Outcomes um, framework is we're mapping social digital inequalities at very local levels in big metropolitan areas. So that's why I'm in Los Angeles right now. We've done it in, we're doing it in London, Sao Paulo, um, Santiago, Sydney, Shanghai, where we're looking at the very local community level, how those things are related. Because, as you might have noticed, I'm talking about proce processes over time. I'm talking about feedback loops. I'm talking about how people have certain resources, how they are then going online to do certain things, get certain outcomes that feed back into those resources. What does that mean? And for those of you who are statisticians, you know that means longitudinal Data, <laughs> panel data, which is something that is really not available in this space at all. We have cohort data, but we don't have long tuna panel data, and there's all kinds of cost reasons for that and other reasons. But what we do have, actually, in many areas, or many countries now, or what is easier to collect, is data at the neighborhood level. And one of the things that we see there is very interesting, is that there are areas where there is really amazing infrastructure, where there's quite a few individuals who have skills, but where they are not translating that into use. And this is the kind of one element that I haven't really discussed much, is to do with motivations and attitudes, is social pressures, not from the governments or the companies who are pushing digital projects online, but from the people that are right around us, who are saying like, hey, why didn't you answer my message today? Or, hey, did you see that thing online? That is the kind of thing, that local community, is what makes people really engage and use the internet. So, and that kind of data we can collect and we can do it over time because we're not dependent on individuals staying in the same place and measuring it. We don't have to follow the same individuals to see what happens to them when they get a job, when they get a pay rise, when they get kids or something like that, or you know, when they get a... Um, God forbid, become disabled or have a really severe health problem, that we can actually look at that at the, at the local neighborhood level and draw some conclusions about what comes first, social change or digital change or how they play off each other. So I'll finish with that and then show you the link to, the, um, to, to this project and then you can approach me if you'd like more information about that and how we're doing that. So first thing is that we need to separate these different transferable skills and measure them in addition to engagement because we know that engagement without skill doesn't lead to good use. Engagement with a specific online activity does not necessarily lead to tangible outcomes. We need to understand the kind of context of that and how skilled that use is. 
we need to also look at that for almost every activity online, even if it's not immediately apparent to us, we need that broad set of skills. If we walk into a supermarket, I'll take an analog example. If we walk into a supermarket, we need to build on our math that we learned in school. We need to build on our reading and writing that we learned in school. We need to know something about how society is organized, right? What are you, how are you supposed to interact? How are you supposed to treat other people? Right? This is the same in the digital world. When we go and look for health information, we need to know how to get to the site. We need to know what kind of questions to ask. We need to know, like, the people who design the site need to know that most people actually do not come and look for information for themselves, but look for information on others, which means that there's a, a whole different discussion going on there in terms of how you design and use those sites. So we need to, it's no use for me conceptualizing access and use without also thinking about how to measure skills and without evaluating programs in terms of the outcomes that they have in our everyday lives. Like, I don't care how many people use eBay unless we can prove that it gets them cheaper products or better products or something like that, right? It's not about the use of eBay, it's about what you do with it. And that was the main thing. This is the, um, well, the project, so as you can see here, this is a map of Britain, and uh, we're doing. The, I have maps of LA and stuff like that too, but um, you, you can click on it. You can see. You can separate separate out how um, use and outcomes uh, differ, um, as well as how different socioeconomic indicators differ at that very local level. And I think oh, I didn't have an end slide. That's interesting. Right. So I'll leave you with the conclusion slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, muchas gracias. Ahora eh, tendremos la exposición del doctor Ricardo Cermeño. El doctor Cermeño es presidente y fundador de la empresa Select desde 1989, una firma líder en México en el análisis del mercado de tecnologías de la información y las comunicaciones y de su impacto en la competitividad de las organizaciones. Ha formado parte del Comité Revisor de Ponencias del IMEF desde hace algunos años y fue vicepresidente de la ponencia 2010 del Instituto Mexicano de Ejecutivos de Finanzas. Bueno, con ustedes les dejo al doctor Ricardo Cermeño. Muchas gracias. Bueno, primero que nada, agradezco la oportunidad de contribuir con este seminario. Eh, voy a tratar de ligar la excelente plática de él con las excelentes conversaciones que tuvimos al principio. Eh, nosotros tenemos 20 años hablando de la economía digital y cuando hubo la ruptura de los dot com y la cruda del año 2000, empezamos a tratar de entender por qué eh, la inversión en tecnología se había eh, desacelerado más que la economía en el 2001 y 2002 y llegamos a a la conclusión de que las expectativas entre los resultados, los outcomes y la, la realidad, las expectativas que tenía el empresario eran muy lejos. ¿okay? Eh, de ahí empezamos a tratar de entender el impacto de la tecnología con muchos estudios y llegamos a la conclusión que no existe un impacto en la competitividad y en la productividad per se hay mucha varianza y encontramos un estudio de London School of Economics en 2004 en donde cruzan el uso de tecnología con mejores prácticas organizacionales y es donde tiene el impacto más alto. Si no logras hacer una transformación organizacional donde el liderazgo y la capacidad gerencial es esencial, no obtiene resultados de la productividad. Desde el 2007 lanzamos una plataforma en línea para cultivar esta capacidad empresarial para aprovechar la tecnología y demostramos también como los estudios de London School que en países emergentes como México una minoría es altamente productiva y usa tecnología, pero que más del 50%, 50% de las empresas este, tiene una madurez empresarial en escalas de 1 a 10, de 1 a 5. Desde entonces 
estamos tratando de cultivar la capacidad organizacional para aprovechar la tecnología, eh, que es lo que está deteniendo a los países menos desarrollados. Esta falta de capacidad empresarial que, en nuestra opinión, es uno de los recursos más escasos y mal distribuidos del país. Ahora me voy al, al tema y después regreso al tema de transformación digital, que es muy importante. Eh, empiezo con mensajes clave que tienen que ver con el objetivo de esta reunión. Eh, nosotros apoyamos las conclusiones de la OCDE. Sin duda, este, los nuevos modelos de negocio realizan actividades económicas que ya existen. Eh, las plataformas digitales permiten escalarlas con mayor efectividad y eficiencia y en nuestra opinión no hay un problema de medición, las variables tradicionales son correctas, tal vez con excepción de los precios y el volumen que este, a lo mejor tiene menos relevancia en la economía digital, sobre todo el tema de volumen. La digitalización contribuye a medir la economía, sin duda, son buenas noticias y lo hablamos en la mañana. Nos da mayor profundidad y oportunidad si adoptamos métodos modernos para monitorizarla, aprovechar transacciones electrónicas, como la factura el, eh, electrónica. Este, se platicaba la, de, en la Unión Europea las iniciativas para traer la información de las plataformas. Bueno, en México tenemos la factura electrónica que mide... Y este, la facturación de manera continua, que sería una gran oportunidad, aparte la contabilidad electrónica. Eh, principales mejores a las metodologías, sin duda, nuestra opinión es que estriba más en el rediseño de la taxonomía de las actividades económicas y no tanto en la propia medición. Reinventar taxonomías como CIAN para reflejar la economía actual. Sin duda, esa es una gran oportunidad. Las limitaciones del CIAN son particularmente evidentes cuando tratas de medir tecnologías de información y comunicaciones. Nosotros estudiamos en CELEC desde 1991 la industria usando una taxonomía de dos dimensiones. Primero, agrupamos a empresas en función de su modelo de negocio y en particular por aspectos que definen el foco dentro de su posicionamiento qué productos y servicios ofrecen, a qué clientes atienden, a través de qué canales llegan a los clientes. Con eso tenemos una matriz eh, que derivamos en 1991 con Cluster Analysis de todos los que venden productos y servicios de tecnología eh, y con el Cluster segmentamos 17 tipos de negocio y cruzamos con más de 400 categorías de lo que venden. Todo este ecosistema lo mide el CIAN en 11, 12 clases. Nunca vas a poder entender la evolución, por ejemplo, del software. Eh, segundo, se identifican las ventas, perdón, es el segundo, la disrupción digital que están experimentando los sectores económicos se deriva de nuevos modelos de negocio y eso es lo que hay que entender. Eh, nuestra principal tarea es identificarlos con una nueva taxonomía y medir su evolución con las variables tradicionales, pero con métodos más modernos de eh, recolección. Entonces, esos son mis principales mensajes. Ahora vamos a revisar temas conceptuales para llegar a ellos. En primer lugar, como vemos nosotros, la, la convergencia, la economía digital, que son redes económicas y sociales que a través de internet, medios interactivos, enlazan la oferta y la demanda, descansa en la convergencia de las tecnologías de información y comunicaciones y las telecomunicaciones. Esta convergencia la tienes que ver en tres grandes ejes. La más fácil y la más obvia es la de tecnología la segunda son los mercados, los servicios de, que se derivan de ella, pero la más difícil es la de las industrias, los modelos de negocio están cambiando. El tema de Telecom, que documenta muy bien el INEGI, es que los negocios de telecomunicaciones están siendo canibalizados, están perdiendo rentabilidad y se están endeudando. 
es un tema de disrupción digital. Están midiendo bien. Se beneficia el consumidor y se benefician otros modelos de negocio. El tema entonces de modelos de negocio es la gran duda. ¿Qué redes, qué servicios, cómo hacer negocio? Las primeras dos son obvias, la tercera no. Eh, ¿Qué redes? Ya sabemos que la tecnología que predominó es las redes de conmutación de paquetes. Adiós todas las redes de comunicaciones tradicionales de circuitos que antes fabricaban los grandes fabricantes de comunicaciones. ¿no? Ha habido versiones híbridas en el camino, a mí me han distraído y enojado mucho el tema de triple play, doble play, trae telefonía y televisión tradicional a un mundo nuevo, eso está de salida. Realmente lo importante es internet, la banda ancha, los datos, los datos son voz, datos, videos, todo y el broadcasting pierde sentido. ¿Qué servicios son? La unión de aplicaciones, de servicios de telecomunicaciones y de estándares que te dan servicios digitales, acceso permanente en todo lugar, móviles y fijos. Hay algo que yo ya me olvidé de solo pensar cuando hablo de economía digital. En, hace 20 años empezamos a hacer análisis de comercio electrónico, es muy chiquito. Pues eso no es economía digital, es uno de los canales de la economía digital. Todos los canales son digitales. Entonces, realmente medir la economía digital es como decía también al principio del, del paper de, de la OCDE, es como tratar de medir la economía electrificada. Okay. Toda la economía es digital. Nosotros hemos usado para entender la evolución de los servicios un concepto que llamamos infraestructura, eh, que empieza con la parte baja de redes, de los enlaces, y va subiendo servidores, equipos de almacenamiento, el software, las aplicaciones, que es una este, frontera entre lo que es la plataforma tecnológica y eh, el contenido. El software son aplicaciones, procesos de negocio y contenido. Todas las innovaciones digitales que estamos disfrutando el día de hoy, no me voy a meter a, al detalle, nos sirven para generar servicios digitales, fáciles de usar, transparentes, que usan la colaboración, las redes sociales, toda la información que estamos generando para que la gente pueda ver televisión, ver una película, monitorear su salud, hacer negocio, esos son los servicios digitales, llegar aquí en la ruta más corta, son paquetes, ya no tecnología, son el uso transparente eh, de la tecnología. Para lograr explorar la transformación en términos de modelos de negocio, nosotros usamos el concepto de infraestructura, que es un tema de los productos y servicios que venden los negocios, contra un concepto de las disciplinas que dominas, es un tema de un libro de los, de los 80, las de los 90, las disciplinas que dominan los líderes de los negocios y mapeamos los modelos de negocio tradicionales de la industria de tecnologías de información, toda esta parte baja es la plataforma de tecnologías de información en los que se dedican a innovar fabricantes de redes, computadoras, software, los que operan la infraestructura operadores de redes, operadores de centros de datos y los que tienen la relación cercana con los clientes que son los integradores de aplicaciones, sistemas y los integradores de redes. Hace 20 años empezamos a hablar de la nube sin, sin ese término, eran application service providers y este, empezaron a convertir el software en algo sumamente fácil de usar. Se empezaron a explorar modelos de renta de software al mes. Eh, yo tuve mucho entusiasmo de ver que los operadores de la infraestructura se iban a adueñar de la economía digital. Ahorita vemos que no. Este, 
Toda esta plataforma nos sirve para interconectar a las cadenas de valor, incluyendo al usuario. Parte de mi duda metodológica de la medición podría ser que mucho del valor se está eh, trasladando hacia el usuario, mucho de los modelos gratis que se discuten en los papers de la OCDE, eh, pero también mucho del valor se está trasladando de esta plataforma hacia los, lo, los llamados OTTs, over the tops. Over the top es el concepto genérico para todos los que están aprovechando el con, la plataforma para hacer negocio. Google, Facebook, eh, AWS, Amazon, aprovechan la plataforma tecnológica y la están canibalizando, por eso la rentabilidad de los operadores va a la baja, porque lo están disfrutando nuevos modelos de negocio. O sea, el tráfico de datos explota, exige mayor inversión de los operadores, pero no les da eh, un crecimiento en su, de, en su facturación. Eso sucedió desde hace 20 años con los operadores fijos y desde hace 5 con los operadores móviles. Entonces, estos nuevos modelos de negocio, los mercados digitales, mejor ejemplo, Amazon, los portales, los buscadores las redes sociales y los apps que están haciendo negocio canibal, usando la plataforma, están canibalizando los equipos y el software, están, se han convertido en los fabricantes más grandes de, de computadoras, Facebook y Google, eh, hacen que el software eh, sea de código abierto, que el equipo baje de precio, se fabrica en China y hace el negocio de otra forma. Entonces, el valor se está trasladando hacia estos nuevos modelos y hacia el usuario. Nosotros, bueno, eh, realmente yo tenía la expectativa que los operadores, entre ellos los de telecomunicaciones, AT&T, eh, América Móvil, fueran los que tuvieran el control del negocio, pero su cultura organizacional y su falta de innovación y de desarrollo de canales hizo que los fabricantes de innovación, Apple, realmente entraran a modelos de contenido, con iTunes como un ejemplo. Eh, entonces es lo que estamos viviendo, sobre todo que muchos de los usuarios están distru también disfrutando de esto. Y este, si no medimos el beneficio a los usuarios, eh, si no medimos el valor agregado de toda la cadena de valor difícilmente vamos a entender el fenómeno. Y eso incluye también la economía informal, no solamente la digital. El beneficio de la economía informal al usuario es realidad y es una válvula de escape, de escape es parte de lo que tendríamos que estar buscando. Eh, esto ya lo hemos platicado mucho. Obviamente las plataformas nos brindan la oportunidad de crear ecosistemas digitales globales nuevos. Nosotros hemos sintetizado estos modelos disruptivos, estos modelos digitales en 10 grandes modelos usando dos conceptos. El concepto de la generación de ecosistemas de, nega de negocio totalmente diferenciados y de una propuesta de valor extraordinaria. No me puedo meter al detalle. Eh, realmente son los modelos más disruptivos que estamos viendo, se han venido este, platicando. En mi opinión, casi todos de ellos están en las actividades definidas, las grandes actividades económicas definidas. Este, mercados digitales, Amazon. <coughs> Amazon es un, es un retail digital, sí, pero eso no quiere decir que no tenga tiendas, está abriendo tiendas. Okay. Es digital la tienda, sí, un noxo en el momento en que el código de barras digitaliza la transacción, desde ahí está disparando toda una cadena digital muy importante. Gracias a, a estos aparatos se presentan oportunidades para que las pequeñas empresas, las, las misceláneas en México, utilicen los smartphones, ustedes saben de las, de las 
excelentes estadísticas del INEGI, que la verdad cada vez disfruto más. Este, el 20% de las microempresas tiene PCs y más del 70% tienen smartphones. A través de pagos móviles, obviamente transform, ayudando a transformar la organización, este, ayudándolos con las capacidades y los usos, el ecosistema de pagos móviles va a poder ayudar a llevar eh, la digitalización a la microempresa siempre y cuando le entendamos que se trata de transformarla. Eh, está iTunes, que es entretenimiento, está Salesforce Software en la nube, eh, Nike, productos digitalizados, Wikipedia, ya la discutimos, Bitcoin, las cámaras digitales, el Uber, el Android, el iPhone. Realmente, eh, en la medida que se presentan estos nuevos modelos de negocio, se da el fenómeno de disrupción que empieza a ser discutido por Marx y más después por Schumpeter, donde es muy difícil imitar. O sea, eh, ¿cuántos años eh, Blockbuster pudo haberse anticipado al tema de Netflix, que por cierto rechazó? Muchísimos años, pero su modelo de negocio descansaba en activos fijos. En las, en las propias eh, of, eh, sucursales. Entonces fue muy difícil el poder reaccionar ante una propuesta de valor extraordinaria y un nuevo ecosistema. Sin embargo, realmente existe la gran oportunidad de transformación digital. O sea, no van a desaparecer los jugadores. En lo, en a finales de los 90 yo dije, wow los intermediarios, yo les llamaba los infomediarios, se van a apoderar de las cadenas de valor y no sucedió, que las cadenas de valor al final están controlados por grandes nodos, tanto compradores como vendedores, las industrias están siendo sujetas a un, un fenómeno de disrupción súper importante, en rojo, en buen anaranjado están las más eh, retadas, entretenimiento y medios, eh, productos tecnológicos y servicios, comercio, servicios financieros y telecomunicaciones, pero todos, casi todos están siendo retados, pero también tienen la gran oportunidad de transformarse y se están transformando. ¿Okay? Eh, esto lo sacamos de, de un ejemplo mexicano de transformación, no quería decir el nombre, pero es un, el banco más fuerte de México, un banco mexicano es Banorte, donde así como los bancos y muchos operadores, eh, muchas empresas este, tienen organizaciones básicamente eh, creadas en silos, donde los productos han sido la pauta, el dueño del producto, el de ahorros, el de cheques, el de inversión, el de hipoteca, el de, el de préstamos, el de crédito, y los clientes tienen que ir de canal en canal tratando de ser atendidos. Este, los canales todos son digitales, ya, no solamente el web, no solamente los portales. Las sucursales en el terminal punto de venta, el cajero automático, las aplicaciones móviles, el web, el teléfono y los kioscos, todos son digitales. Pero realmente lo que necesitamos es impulsar su transformación, romper con estos hilos, hacer una reingeniería del negocio, obviamente con un liderazgo abierto, donde este, se rompen las jerarquías, se hace participar a la gente para que el cliente esté en el centro y todos los canales digitales, todos los canales son digitales, no hay ningún canal que no vaya a ser digital. Entonces, necesitamos explorar eh, la medición con este principio en mente que todos los canales son digitales y que lógicamente tenemos gran oportunidad para entender la evolución de la digitalización tanto en el acceso como en el uso como el, la penetración de los canales digitales apoyamos entonces las conclusiones de la OCDE eh, la digitalización contribuye a medir la economía, eh, sin duda tenemos la gran ventaja 
o desventaja, no sé, de tener una plataforma gubernamental que nos ayuda a medir las transacciones electrónicas cada vez más y tiene un impacto favorable en la economía. Creo yo que debemos reinventar más bien las taxonomías para reflejar la economía actual. Eh, esta disrupción que están experimentando la mayoría de los sectores económicos se deriva de estos nuevos modelos de negocio. Entonces tenemos la gran oportunidad de que en el CIAN se identifiquen los nuevos modelos de negocio dentro de las actividades tradicionales. Eh, nuestra principal tarea, por lo tanto, es esto, identificar esta nueva taxonomía, medir su evolución con variables tradicionales y explorar métodos modernos de recolección, que yo creo que sería la gran oportunidad. Muchas gracias.